Grace Randolph Beyond the Trailer. Hey, Grace, good to see you. It's such an honor to meet you in person, kind it's of. It's all sweater, with all the socks on sweater. Are you, hang on, is that really your background? Are you that high up? Yes. Because you know people have those fake backgrounds for Zoom. Yes, that, some, people, looks, some people think it's fake. It and I'm like, I, I can't afford to animate cars behind me. <laughs> you can see the highway. I'm like, I couldn't afford to do that. <laughs> we do follow each other on Twitter. It's so nice, but I know you follow a lot of people. So it makes me feel very nice that you you're, intentionally followed me. <laughs> you're one of the best ones. You're one of the best ones. <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm such a fan of your work. Oh, uh, you know, this was a great show, by the way. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Have you seen oh, all eight? Have you seen the whole thing? I'm sorry, what? You know, all eight episodes have you seen? Oh, I watched it in a day. No way, really? I watched it in a single day. At first, I wasn't sure. I was like, another superhero show. Yeah, yeah. By the end of it, Oh my God. I was like, it's so I good. I know. But I'm, I'm, without spoiling, how good are the actors, though? I mean, it's the most amazing cast, isn't it? I mean, the cast are. Incredible. Yeah. yeah. I, I was just so impressed. It just, and it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's so unique. You yes. know, the, the, th the thing I want to ask you first is when Kick Ass came out in 2010, yeah. mm -hmm. there were only three, I looked it up, there were only three other big comic book properties that year Iron Man 2, Mega Mind, which counts. Yeah. And absolutely. then Heroes ended. It had its series finale at the beginning of the year. Yeah. What is it like a decade later to come into the marketplace, which is just flooded with comic book adaptations? Well, you say that, but it's really weird. I think we've, we've heard about superhero fatigue so much, you know, that every time you pick up Variety or Hollywood Reporter, they say is superhero fatigue about to happen, right? We haven't had superhero stuff for about two years. Like Avengers Endgame was a couple That's of years true. ago, over two years. Mm -hmm. We had Spider-Man very shortly after that, but really very little since. And typically there'll be seven or eight big superhero projects every year, some years even more. Sometimes it's almost once a month. But because of coronavirus and nothing been released in cinemas and the TV show's not been shot, everything's been held up. It's a nightmare. So I've got superhero starvation, right? I want more superheroes. Yeah. So in a, <laughs> in a weird way, the, the audience is so primed for superhero stuff now that the last big superhero thing that came out was Avengers Endgame, and it made $2.7 billion, right? So for me, that's not a sign of fatigue. That's a sign of we're still climbing, right? This is awesome. Yeah. Then, then like, it, it was a nightmare. It was taken away from us for two years, and now we're bringing it back. So I think we're launching at the best possible time. We're actually releasing something when we're all so hungry for it. I've watched it about 200 times while I'm in the edit suite and everything, right? Really? I'm still, yeah, I'm still excited. You're that hands-on? Oh, I'm a complete control freak, complete control freak. Yeah, I, <laughs> I love that about I you. I didn't realize how much I was. But, you know, we sold, my wife and I sold Mellow World to Netflix in 2017. And uh, then we took on jobs. Like I took the president of Mellow World job and she's CEO, Lucy. Um, and we sat with everybody and we said, what show will we make first? And everybody agreed Jupiter's was the one to do first. Um, and they said, you know, who, who would you like on it? And I was like, well, I've just seen Daredevil season one. Stephen the Knight's awesome. Let's get the Knight in for this, you know? And that was, God, three years ago, I think. And then everybody's deals have to get done. And, you know, you have to kind of see plots, how it's all coming together. You've got the scripts and everything. And right up until five weeks ago, I was sitting, from October last year until five weeks ago, I watched it three times a week and made little noodly changes right up until literally five weeks ago. I'd think of a line of dialogue that I thought we should tweak that little line and get the actor back and get them to- Really? Oh, oh, yeah, a lot. And I would wake up at five o'clock in the morning and I'd come down and do an email and I'd say, why don't we shave 10 seconds off the end of that little scene? So there was, I was going crazy with it, but I was just having the best time in my life. And, you know, I, I didn't realize how annoying I was to everybody else until we locked it. And they all looked relieved once we, we locked it. And done, you know? <laughs> well, I have to say, you, you were right to do that because it really is so well put together. And I was on the edge of my seat in particular with yeah. the origin of our original heroes. How awesome does that look? That was couldn't believe how good that was. And that so was Stephen the Knight. That was Stephen the Knight because I'd written it in the book um, as what eight pages of issue one and six pages of issue four. You yeah. know, the, the nineteen twenty nine stuff was relatively short, but what I mentioned in two lines for some scenes, you know, Stephen had for twenty minutes or something. You know, the guy having a nervous breakdown and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know? So I mean, all the visions, but he um, he had this idea to do it like close encounters, you know, to stretch it out and make it feel like a man's a journey. Perfect but comparison. It, it is, is like close encounters. 
and it was a, it was a beautiful idea, you know. And I, he he suggested this a couple of years back, and it was perfect, wasn't it? Because it really meant something when they got to the destination at the end. Oh, the so, emotional payoff! I, I yeah. mean, I felt it too. I felt it too. I thought it was fantastic. I I never get bored of it, even sitting in, in the edit suite. Like, I'm I'm still choked up at that ending, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so it's amazing. I I I really I. What made you decide in the first place to come up with such a, a complicated origin story? Usually someone <laughs> makes a wish or touches something and bam, they're a superhero. But this is like a saga. Well, it all ties in, you know, it's a, it's a six volume book that I've done. It's a big, big book. You know, I think it's what, it's about 600 pages. I read it. I read it when it came out. Well, there's still, there's still got 250 pages to go or something, you know, that there's, that we start again. Because I think there's four volumes that's been released already. Um, there's the stuff set in the 1950s, the stuff set in the present day, and then there's a future storyline that we're starting in June, which is oh, going wow. to end. So we find out what the island really was and all that kind of stuff, because there's a big mystery that's not been resolved yet, you know? So Miller World it's, is going to stay as a comic book company and uh, a, a, a visual medium too. Yeah, I, well, Netflix said to me, well, great, you know, we can start doing movies and television shows. And I was like, I love comics, you know, I want to still do some comics as well. So I had it carved into my contracts for the seven years I'm at Netflix. I actually had it carved in. I could still do a certain number of comics every year too. So oh, that's I, great. I love, I love doing it. So kind of what I'll do now is the new stuff I create, like Magic Order and things like that, or Space Bandits, I'll create them as a franchise in-house at Netflix. And then some of them, we also turn into comic books where I bring in designers and so on. And then we, we bring them out as comics. So we do it kind of the reverse of what I used to do. We do the, the franchise first and then reverse engineer it into a comic book. Oh, that's interesting. That's great. I'm glad it's still, I mean, it's good to keep an eye on where these things originated from. And I, you know, I speaking- comics, right? What, comics, I'm sorry? Comics is what I wanted to do when I was five. You know, I never mm -hmm. wanted to stop doing comics. I love it. And speaking of comics, you know, when I was watching this show, I was like, wow, Hollywood has finally done it, thanks to people like you, where they've replicated what it's like to have a stack of comics every week, where you do <laughs> read lots of different superhero stories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how you were very, you were, you've been very good at carving out a space for yourself in comic books. You know, a lot of the current Renaissance was largely kickstarted by you, by the work you did at Marvel and with your own comics. You know, Kick Ass, Wanted, stuff like that, Kingsman. How do you stay ahead of the curve? Continue to stay ahead of the curve today. Well, you know, I discovered a really interesting thing when I was about 29. I started doing comics when I was a teenager. And I, I would always try and anticipate what the audience wanted or what, what, the, what the companies wanted because I'd be trying to get work, you know. So I'd always think, what would the editors want? And then I, I came to this weird thing where I suddenly, when I was 29, I thought, I'm going to write the kind of comic I want to read. And that has stood me in good stead. It really has. And I think the same thing with movies and television shows. I think, what would I want to see? And so never try and anticipate anything. Just do what you want to see yourself. And, and it works. It works every time. So it's great. That's so cool. My final question for you is that I really, really liked uh, um, the Utopian. Yeah. I thought it was interesting to see him try to hold on to this moral compass. Yeah. And it's getting more and more difficult. And I think a lot of people feel that way today in real life. Yeah. You know, can yeah. you still have this like American mor morality that's kind of like yeah. been made famous by Hollywood? Mm -hmm. and comic books yeah. uh what are you hoping that people take from the utopians journey in this first season well it's funny because everybody's got a different interpretation of this because my oldest kids i've got three daughters and my oldest one's oh he's a bit hard on his kids isn't he you know whereas yeah. my, my parent friends fellow parent friends they're like yeah he's doing the right thing you know he's, he's he's a good guy and everything you know so it's really interesting everybody brings a different thing to it when they watch it but for me what i like about him is he's a little bit right and he's a little bit wrong and what I like about the, the other characters is they're the same. So the utopian, he thinks we must preserve the status quo. America kind of works. Let's try and keep this together. Whereas the kids are like, I don't like the world I'm inheriting here. I think the place could be a lot better than this. And there's an ethical argument for that as well. You know, like, should we interfere with people in the third world who have got nothing? Should we go and help them? You know, superheroes should maybe be doing more things, stopping people in concentration camps on the other side of the world toppling unfair regimes so it's a big ethical argument with these guys and I love that they're both kind of right you know like the, I'm, I'm an utopian side to some extent but he's even starting to realize I've been doing I was supposed to save America 90 years ago and here we are with the very same financial crash looming that we had in 1929 and America's falling apart again so I haven't accomplished anything so I, I kind of like the moral complexity of them all you know there's no super villains 
almost at all in this show is the superheroes fighting with each other that's really interesting. Yeah, I loved that. It was. I thought that moral complexity, you say it perfectly, was one of the things that also helps this show stand out from the crowd. Who's your favorite character? I'm curious, who do you like? I really like Ben Daniels as an actor. Amazing, isn't he? So yeah. I'm, I'm, I lean a little bit towards uh, um, Brainwave. I think right. he's he's like really fascinating. And But I, I like the whole cast. I thought it, Chloe looked like she was ripped right from the comic book. Oh, and how good an actress is Elena? I mean, she's like 23, but she's got the gravitas of Meryl Streep or something like this. It's, she's she's amazing. She's going to be massive, I think. And you know, Ian Quinlan, who plays Hutch? Yeah. So charismatic. I love yeah. Andrew. The future plans we have for Andrew's character, Brandon, We've got some great stuff planned for him and everything. You know, like, I love them all. It's really weird. Matt Lancer is incredible. And Leslie as well, you know. And Josh. I mean, you know what I love about Josh? See, see, when we were casting this, like, we talked about various people as possibilities. But trying to find somebody who looks like a superhero and can fill that suit, but also has the acting chops to pull off what he has to do. Because he has to be the young guy who's looking forward to the future. He's the old guy who realizes he's failed. And he goes through the ringer in this. I mean, you've seen where episodes three and four and everything go with him, you know? Yeah. You need a proper actor. So somebody who looks like Superman, but acts like Anthony Hopkins. I mean, that's hard to find that guy, you know? But <laughs> but, but Josh really, uh, Josh blew everyone away with this. I, I'm so delighted with him. Oh, yeah. Fantastic casting. I was blown away with his performances as well. Thank you so much for your time. It was really nice uh, to meet you in person. Nice to see you. See you soon.